Hello, bonjour, my name is Nadine Normand Marconnet. I am lecturer at Monash University in Australia. And today I will present you a paper co-authored by Professor Joseph Lobianco from Melbourne University. Our topic is the reception of the Common European Framework of Reference in Australian Universities. For this presentation, I will talk briefly about the international debate which emerged soon after the publication of the framework by the Council of Europe in 2001. I will then give you some information regarding language policy in Australia and how the importation of language assessment is depicted in the available scientific literature. The third section is focused on the data collected for our survey among academic staff and students in Australian universities. I will outline the main findings of this preliminary overview. Finally, the fourth section will highlight some key elements regarding the future of the CFR in Australia. Today, the CFR is recognized as an obvious example of the globalization of education policy. As of 2013, 39 language versions are available, including not only various European languages, but also Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Russian, French sign language, just to cite a few. In Europe, as shown in the latest extensive survey done by the Council of Europe in 2007, the CFR has been adopted and adapted in 30 member states out of 47. In the report established from this survey and presented during the Intergovernmental Policy Forum held the same year, it has been reiterated that the CFR is a reference tool designed to coordinate the objectives of education at all levels. This framework is useful to develop both strategic language policy documents and practical teaching material. In Europe, it remains the most reliable reference for curriculum planning and it contributes to more transparency and coherency across the educational sector in general. As clearly mentioned in the introduction of the CFR, it provides a common basis for the elaboration of language syllabuses curriculum guidelines, examination, textbooks, etc. across Europe. The framework is a descriptive scheme which combines general competences such, such as knowledge, skills, existential competence and ability to learn with communicative language competences including linguistic, pragmatic, sociolinguistic and sociocultural competences. Overall, 34 illustrative scales are summarized in a global scale composed of six levels from A1 for basic user beginner level to C2 for proficient user mastery level. It must be noticed that the CFR is action-oriented and language independent. For its designers, the CFR is and must be considered as a non-prescriptive and flexible framework. Among them, Brian North uses a musical metaphor to describe it as a concertina-like reference tool, not an instrument to be applied. Soon after its publication, the CFR has received severe critics, both on theoretical and political aspects of its implementation. In 2004, a debate was launched in The Guardian by Glenn Fulcher, a respected linguist in Great Britain, who argued that the implementation of the CFR could lead European countries to build tests from an unsafe framework due to the lack of relevance and validity of level descriptors in second language acquisition. As later pointed out by the so-called Dutch CEF construct project, the descriptors provided in the CFR are limited and can serve only as a starting point for specifying test content. In response to the critics about the validity and reliability of scales in processes of developing assessment system from experts in the SLA field, a report was published by the Council of Europe in 2007 to rectify imbalances in interpretation and use. Nevertheless, the CFR is still often considered as an efficient way of imposing forced harmonization inside and outside Europe, particularly in the field of assessment. At some extent, the CFR is perceived as one another instance of linguistic imperialism. In addition to the challenges linked to the inadequacy of level descriptors in clear context of a migrant population, other cases of misuse are also reported, such as 
irrelevant recruitment assessment practices in the outsourcing for business processing in India and in Philippines. In this controversial situation, the authors of the CFR and their supporters have to constantly struggle against misinterpretation and misuse of the framework by insisting on its flexible nature. Fleming reports that can-do statements are often viewed by the opponents to the CFR as narrow, reductive, functionalist and finally behaviorist. Nevertheless, for him, competence frameworks have the potential to focus on the importance of use and purpose, implying a more dynamic rather than static concept of language. Moreover, according to Davidson and Fulcher, who developed in 2007 a specific descriptor for service and counter specification from the generic one proposed in the CFR at level A1, the CFR is a valuable starting point for language test development. Later on, Jones and Saville conducted a project called Asset Language in the UK, which exemplified the need to develop contextualized practical ways of realizing the CFR potential as a framework for teaching and learning. This pragmatic example of the potential and necessary contextualization of the CFR are one of the ways to address criticism and skepticism about the validity of the framework. Another method is to reiterate regularly the aims of this project launched by the Council of Europe, described by TRIM as follows. The framework should be flexible, open, dynamic and non-dogmatic, since the aim was not to prescribe how language should be learned, thought and assessed, but to raise awareness, stimulate reflection and improve communication among practitioners. Today, the growing influence of the CFR behind Europe is increasingly documented. Various papers and books describe the impact of the framework wherever it has been officially adopted at a state level by the authorities or more commonly incorporated by policy makers and institutions in specific contexts. Numerous case studies on language policy analysis are illustrating the impact of the CFR in Asia as well as in America. A lot of papers are available in China, Japan, Korea or Taiwan. Regarding the American continent, literature has been produced on Argentina, Canada, Colombia, Mexico and the USA. However, for the Middle East region, a few papers only are available on Turkey or Iran whereas nothing reveals any kind of influence of the CFR in the African region. Australia is a country characterized by a high degree of multilingualism and multiculturalism with a long and contested history of language policy. In this context, Lobianco identifies five language policy discourses. The first one is Britishism, which promotes English only and which is modeled on Southern British norms. A limited presence is possible for prestige foreign languages, typically those found in British schools, and especially Latin premised on the idea of mental training and classical literature, as well as French, later German, and Italian. This discourse is also based on the repression of immigrant and indigenous languages. On the other hand, Australianism was a nationalist reaction to British English, especially in folk literature. This discourse was asserted by native-born and Irish and other immigrant groups and aims at the promotion of Australian norms of English and beginnings of openness to indigenous languages. Multiculturalism begins with second generation, mostly Australian-born children of post-World War II mass immigration. During the 70s, this discourse becomes the dominant paradigm of language policy, rejecting foreign language teaching in favor of local immigrant and indigenous community languages. It transformed primary schools into sites of language study and massively expanded language offerings. Asianism has a longer history and strongly emerged due to the post-UK admission to European common market in mid-70s. Asia literacy grew rapidly and became dominant in late 1980s, 
for both commercial and strategic aspects. In 1994, it was reduced to four priority languages, Chinese Mandarin, Indonesian, Japanese, Korean. In 2012, Korean is replaced by Hindi. Economism appeared during the 90s. Both sides of politics adopted neoliberal and globalization principles in education. Education began to be considered as an export community. Australian university and latter schools rapidly become major provider of English medium education to the Asian market, favored English and commercial foreign languages. The available scientific literature on the reception of the CFR in Australia is still very limited. In light of these language policy discourses currently in force, we can interpret reaction to the CFR as applied to education. In one hand, opinions expressed by researchers and experts are mainly negative, arguing that standards in general impose uniformity and globalization, and that the CFR in particular has emerged as a mechanism for control of foreign language education throughout every level of the educational system. Moreover, the proficiency orientation and the absolute scale founding the CFR do not give credit to the context in which a language is acquired, while achievement orientation currently promoted in Australia for Asian languages actually does. This kind of attitude uses a combination of Australianist reasoning. It means that the country should have its own distinctive assessment systems designed for its own needs. And it also shows influences from the multiculturalism and Asianism discourses. On the other hand, the increasing influence of the CFR on the English testing sector in Australia is reported as an unavoidable phenomenon, as revealed in a national official report on English language intensive courses for overseas students, means ELICOS, published in 2007. This trend has been confirmed in an interview with Dr. Milonovic, the chief executive of ILTS co-owner Cambridge Hazel, printed in August 2011 in the Australian newspaper. Now, let's talk about our survey. Our survey expands a collaborative project involving all language programs in School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics at Monash University. As a first step, the learning outcomes of Monash language programs were aligned with those of the CFR in 2011, and an interactive website has been developed since 2012. In addition, one short online questionnaire was designed to collect feedback on this implementation through SurveyMonkey software. For this, the data were first collected among Monash University staff and students. Then, to reach a broader audience, the online survey was promoted on mid-2012 by the Language and Culture Network for Australian Universities through invitation for participation to the 600 affiliated members in Australia. From this preliminary overview, we intend to conduct further investigation across the sector, among policymakers, educational authorities, etc., in the next, next future. The purpose of this survey was to draft an overview of the current perception of the CFR in the Australian tertiary sector. In this paper, the following research questions are addressed. First, how is the CFR received in Australia compared to the current situation in other non-European countries? And second, what are Australian students' and academic staff's attitude regarding the CFR? For this, the questionnaire consisted of 11 items, including closed and open-ended questions, as well as statement-type items on a five-point Likert scale from one strongly agree to five strongly disagree. Some free sections were included for additional comment. The quantitative data were collected and analyzed with tools provided by SurveyMonkey, like Excel tables, for example. The qualitative data were converted in order to enable discourse analysis, both from SurveyMonkey and NVivo 10 software. Overall, 135 respondents contributed to this survey. I will now comment briefly the main quantitative findings illustrated by the following graphs, which summarize answers for the 11 questions. For the first three questions, among the 73 students and the 62 staff who participated in the online survey, 66% declared that they were familiar with the CFR, 
while 60% also claimed to be aware of the common reference level from A1 for basic user to C2 for proficient user. Overall, it seems that academics were more informed than students. In the following questions, including different proposals, we ask them how they heard about the CFR and the six level scale, and most of them selected the category scientific literature and material used in class, which means that they had more opportunities to become familiar with the framework, mainly during research activity and by professional practice. Moreover, the additional data provided in the free section of this question show that opportunities to hear about the CFR were provided through personal collaboration with colleagues more than through institutional promotion. For the following question, the two-thirds of participants recognized that the adaptation of the CFR in their institution was or could be useful. As shown in the graph, while a large proportion of them were hesitant, the opposition to this statement was mainly issued by academic staff. Then, the result for the Likert scale items show that our participants equally acknowledge that the CFR is providing both academic and professional benefits. Positive opinions are quite well balanced between the two categories. Also, one third of the respondents state that they neither agree nor disagree. To elaborate on the positive impact of the CFR on the institution, a series of five Likert scale items were also included. As shown in this table, and according to the rating average and the grouping of strongly agree and agree categories in percentage, our participants were more likely to admit that the adaptation of the CFR could be helpful mainly because it evaluates outcomes against an international standard. The fact that the CFR provides ways to align assessment with proficiency level and promotes better curriculum design across languages is also well accepted. At a lesser degree, the positive impact of the CFR is linked to the easiness of can-do descriptors used to map language levels and to the CFR's implementation all around the world. On the same principle, the following question was designed to analyze the reasons of a potential rejection of the CFR. Actually, 42% of the participants recognized that the negative perception of the CFR and the six levels case in Australia is due to the limited knowledge in the country. At the opposite, they mainly did not think that the CFR is refused because this framework is too complicated or does not give a clear picture of language proficiency. Moreover, a majority of them also declined the idea that standardization and harmonization mean less flexibility and less diversity in language program. Finally, a greater indecision emerged regarding the fact that the CFR is not adapted to the Australian context. Finally, as illustrated in the two last graphs, 74% of our respondents are convinced that their institution not only should promote the use of the CFR, but also should organize training sessions prior to their implementation. Nevertheless, it is worthy to note that the stronger opposition to these statements came from academics, while the need of training was mainly expressed by students. As previously mentioned, the researchers decided to proceed to a qualitative analysis based on the comments collected in the free text section included in the questionnaire, as you can see is this extract of our database. All respondents were coded according to their institution, MU for Monash University, OU for other universities, and their category, A for student and B for staff. The 67 additional remarks were grouped in the three main categories including 22 quotes in no ID category, 14 quotes in guns category, and 31 quotes in prose category. The three main categories were divided in subcategories according to the different clusters which emerge, as detailed in this table. Where possible, we selected representative quotes to illustrate the main findings arising in our corpus. The majority of comments in the first category were simple quotes such don't know or no ID. Nevertheless, some of them elaborate on this as illustrated in these three quotes.
Even if limited in number, the comments provided by 14 of our respondents, 13 academics and one student that we grouped in the cons category, are nevertheless illustrating the variety of criticism existing in the scientific literature. Not surprisingly, the main dot and negative judgment for six of our respondents focused on the applicability of the CFR and the six level scales to non-European languages, mainly regarding Asian languages. Other pointed out the limitations of the CFR in terms of assessment or curriculum design, sometimes in a vigorous style, as you can see in the last course of this page. Someone mentioned also risks linked to the use of the CFR as a benchmarking tool, while someone else questioned the relevance of the CFR in Australia compared to other international standards. Finally, the category of pros is composed of 31 comments dispatched in five subcategories. In the first subcategory, the respondents openly claimed their support to the implementation of the CFR by reporting the successful adaptation in their institution. In the second subcategory, we grouped the comments related to the positive characteristics of the CFR, which is self-explanatory, incorporates intercultural and sociocultural features, and promotes academic mobility. In addition, the positive impact of the CFR in terms of curriculum design and assessment is significantly commented by these two students. Few other comments are focused on the potential extension across the sector in the schools or for international students. Finally, some participants were recognizing the potential positive impact of the CFR in their institution, provided that a review of the programs and some professional development activities are included in the process of the implementation of the framework. In the context of Australian language policy history and the provision of languages, what are the prospects for adoption, modification or full rejection of the CFR? To understand these prospects, we have produced data showing the reactions and views of the most interested parties, academic language teachers and students. However, the literature on policy borrowing suggests that other actors are involved in determining how and to what extent external innovation are transferred and taken up in given contexts. It is likely that the current level of closure toward the CFR will change in Australia in light of current developments in language policy at the macro level as government appears to be moving towards a more standardized national language provision. Another source of possible innovation in adoption of the CFR are second language teachers in schools many of whom appear to have a different or more open attitude to its use. If these two sources will bring about change and the pace of this change cannot be predicted. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer any question and receive any feedback, so you are most welcome to post a comment and to send me a message. Bye-bye.